So good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here. I hope we give you some interesting information. I know my colleagues here have some incredibly exciting data and case studies to share with you. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to take a moment and acknowledge the exciting time in the history of energy policy that we are all enjoying right now. <clears throat> Over the past decade, we've seen a truly breathtaking drop in the cost of renewable energy and the cost of energy storage and the cost of computing power necessary to integrate both of those into a functional grid. At the same time, the impacts of climate change in California and around the world have gone from an if and when to a now and how. And the, then the, the voters in California have elected a deep bench of legislators who support tangible action on climate change, as well as the successive series of governors that support similar action. And this is not only in Sacramento. Over the past couple months, we've had more than 50 local jurisdictions contact the Energy Commission and express an interest in adopting re what's called REACH codes. These are local building energy standards that exceed the state standard. This is almost an order of magnitude more local jurisdictions interested in such a code than we normally get in our three-year code change cycles. It can be exciting and a little bit hectic when the vectors of the market and politics point in the same direction. California already has some of the largest renewable energy generation facilities in the country and in the world. And over the past decade, we've seen a rapid decline in the cost, and that has resulted in a significant expansion in this, in this state. In addition, in the last code change cycle for the building standards, we have required solar on new homes. This is the first time this has been done in the country. So we've had a number of our renewable portfolio standards in California, and this has led to a significant increase in the generation of renewable energy in the state. And you can see here that we've reached, we've reached all of those standards. We've reached all of those. We've met or exceeded all of those RPS standards. There are two bills that I'd like to highlight here before we get started. The first is SB 100 that was passed last year. SB 100 puts us on a path, a new renewable portfolio standard path, 50% by 2026, 60% renewable energy by 2030, and 100% zero carbon by 2045. We are currently at 34% renewable and 51% zero carbon if you count our large hydro. In order to get, our electricity grid is currently supported by natural gas spinning generation. It is critical for us to get to the next level. For us to get past 60%, we have to achieve new types of technologies. We have to extend the capacity of storage, and we have to integrate our demand side. I call this demand optimization. I especially like Marianne and her team developed a framework a couple years ago. It's called Shape, Shift, Shed, and Shimmy. <laughs> this framework represents the endpoint that we need to get to for the technologies that we need to implement. So the shape changes the shape of the load, of the demand, in a way that is essentially invisible to the utility, in a way that it's similar to the way demand normally works, but it changes the way that that demand behaves. The shift is active demand optimization, where you tell various uh, energy consuming technologies to behave in a certain way so that it supports the local distribution grid. Shed is a traditional type of demand response, where in an emergency or in a critical situation, you will curtail certain loads. And shimmy is a new type, a synthetic inertia. So this is short minute or second level demand side optimization to maintain the voltage and the frequency on the grid. We need all of these types of resources that can come from both existing technologies like batteries and from new technologies that some of you in this room might help implement. A second bill I'd like to cover briefly 
is AB 3232 that the legislature also passed last year. This commits California to addressing the carbon emissions from residential and commercial buildings, from all building stock. <clears throat> the legislature put us on a target of 40% below 1990 levels of carbon from building stock. This is a research bill. It specifies that the Energy Commission and all the other agencies involved will look at how to achieve this goal, but it is on an incredibly short timeline. It requires the Energy Commission to report back to the legislature by next year and the year after and each year going forward until we get to these targets by 2030. So it's an incredibly short time frame and it has a, a very high level of technical specificity about how we, how we do this. So I have high confidence that this is gonna push us forward rapidly. It's not just new policy drivers that push us to adopt these technologies and move forward with a fully renewable grid. It's also some existing authorities that we have. One example is the Energy Commission's Load Management Standards Authority. When the Energy Commission was created in the 1970s, one of the, I think, an elegant piece of legislation that was included in the Warren Alquist Act was the ability for the Energy Commission to adopt uh, standards for local utilities for programs of two different major kinds and one minor. The first is energy storage. So the Energy Commission has the authority to require programs for energy storage in each utility service territory. And the second is automation. Remember, this is language that was created in the 1970s, but it is remarkably applicable today. And the third area is kind of a minor area is we have the ability to provide recommendations on rates. We've already done this. I was the project manager of the previous load management proceeding back in 2008. We recommended time of use rates. The, the Public Utilities Commission was fully on board with that. And we are now adopting those a few years later than we had hoped, but we're getting there. So this is an existing authority that the Energy Commission has that we intend to exercise in the near future to help move this forward. My point here is that the depth of support for the work that we have ahead of us to achieve a 100% zero carbon grid is deep in California. When President John F. Kennedy suggested we go to the moon within a decade, his goal wasn't to bring back rocks from the moon. His goal was to set a challenge before our society and to train an entire generation of scientists and engineers. Similarly, the goals in California for renewable portfolio standards, for zero net energy homes, they aren't simply to generate renewable energy or to build homes that have zero net energy. They're to create the markets, to create the technologies, to design and vet the programs that we need in order to implement this in the real world. California represents only 1% of global climate pollutants. We cannot do this alone, but our intent is to develop the programs and the technologies and the policies here so that we can export those around the world and get this done. So my colleagues here will tell you now how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. So uh, I'm Harish Kamath with EPRI Electric Power Research Institute, uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, some of the technologies that, we're that uh, we are trying to implement to uh, satisfy the challenge that uh, Gabe and his colleagues have set forward for us. As, as, as uh, Gabe said, uh, you know, these are huge challenges, and in fact, in many ways, they're more, uh, they're more daunting than the challenges that we faced when we were going to the moon. Uh, because, uh, you know, the chips are, are down and, and some of the stuff is, is for real now. You know, we have to do this. This is, uh, uh, when we're dealing with climate change is one of the greatest challenges that our species has ever uh, faced. And uh, many of these technologies are absolutely necessary uh, for addressing that. So uh, that's really what we're, what we're trying to do here. Uh, as you can tell from just getting these slides up, technology can be a challenge. Uh, it doesn't always <laughs> work seamlessly, uh, even if we're prepared. And so we have to sort of wing it at times uh, and actually start, you know, start going forward. Uh, we don't have everything planned, but we can start. 
Uh, and as we get closer to, uh, as, as we get further down this road, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, you know, we'll make more progress. So let me just start by saying that, you know, for, from, a, from a practical standpoint, we're already in the midst of a enormous transformation in the uh, power system today. And you've heard the buzzwords as they, as they go across. Digitization, decentralization, decarbonization. These are real things that are happening on the grid today. Uh, and I'll start with the last one, decarbonization. Again, it's a very important part of everything that we've done. Uh, we are seeing more renewables on the grid than we have ever had. We, they are increasing at an exponential rate. Uh, and so we've seen wind and solar uh, make huge strides in the last uh, 20 years. Certainly, that's not universal. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. as a whole still only has about 5% renewables, but here in California, we've seen tremendous strides, uh, in part because we're blessed with, trans uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with some great resources here, especially in terms of sun uh, and, in, and a little bit of wind as well. Uh, but also because of some very visionary things that the people of California have done, uh, partly through uh, government incentives and other uh, and, and other things, but also just through um, a willingness to try some of these new technologies and and implement them. Uh, th this and that's not just at the at the power plant level, uh, but also at the home level, and that comes into the second buzzword that we talk about, decentralization. Uh, when we're looking at these new technologies, we're not just looking at the supply side uh, on the left side of this graph. It used to be that that was really simple. And uh, you know it was, it was all about control of the power plant. And you could, all you had to do was control your power plant and move them up and down, and you could regulate the entire grid. Not anymore. Because we have more renewables, we have less control over the generation side. But then we also have more control downstream. Because we have sensors, we have uh, ways of telling what's going on at the edge of the grid that we never had before. We also have ways of affecting those things because we have local generation, we have things like smart inverters which go along with local generation, uh, with solar and, uh, uh, and with other DER, uh, like, like uh, local storage systems, home storage systems, uh, V to G systems with, uh, with, with plug-in vehicles, uh, and so on. So we're looking at a, a new system that's really looking, that uh, has a lot of different options on it. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the technologies that you hear about in this, in this thing. And I want to start with energy storage because energy storage is something that a lot of people talk about in terms of the macro. Uh, and one of the big hype things today, I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it hype a little bit because it's, it's, um, you hear a lot about it, but it's, it's poorly understood. Uh, we're, we're talking about solar plus storage. So there's a lot of solar plus storage plants that are being deployed now. Uh, we've seen large-scale solar plants that have storage along with them, and people look at the, at the costs for some of those things and the announcements that come out uh, very breathlessly that, oh my gosh, these things are incredibly low cost. And so we had a few years ago systems that were installed in, uh, uh, in Hawaii, incredibly low rates. At, uh, at, at that time, we were looking at 14 cents a kilowatt hour uh, in, in terms of its cost. Uh, and then later on, it came, actually came down to a little bit over 11 cents a kilowatt hour. That's pretty amazing uh, for, for what we could do with solar plus storage. But that's even eclipsed by what you saw on the mainland, where people started talking about four and a half cents uh, at Tucson. And then in Colorado uh, last year, people actually went uh, to uh, three cents. And now we're hearing about two cents per kilowatt hour for solar plus storage. That's an incredibly low price. That's a lot cheaper than coal. That's a lot cheaper than gas. So how can you do that? How can we do that? Does this mean that we can just put solar and storage up there and manage the whole grid with it? Well, not quite. Because remember that the solar is only there when the sun is shining. And the storage that they're talking about for these is relatively small. So it does give you a little bit of control. It's great as part of a balanced breakfast, a balanced diet, as you might say. But we still need to have some more, uh, some of those sort of reliable sources there. But what this means is that when we see a lot of solar out there, we have a little bit of storage in there. We do need a, some uh, some gas, and we need some other resources. We've got a path towards decarbonization here uh, through these technologies that looks very low cost. So that's a that's a great thing. We're not quite there yet. We're uh, we're we're getting there. We're getting to the point now where some of these costs, even at uh, even in places like Hawaii, which don't have the benefit of a huge grid around them, uh, are at uh, less than ten cents a kilowatt hour. This was unthinkable 25 years ago, uh, and so it's a great it's a great step forward. We still have a long way to go, but uh, it's uh, it's getting there. 
Uh, another thing that you hear about today is that energy storage is going to take the place of all the gas turbines out there uh, and because energy storage is cheaper than gas turbines. That's not quite true. Uh, you know, we are certainly seeing the price come down very rapidly, but combustion turbines still are quite a bit cheaper than, uh, uh, than batteries. So you're not going to see this universally. Here in California, we have a special case. We have, uh, while well, we have great solar resource, and, and so the solar resource ha helps us during the daytime, uh, and then during the night we don't have a lot of load. So we really only have to take care of that evening time period, three or four hours. In, in a three or four hour case, batteries might actually make sense. But and so here in California, we're actually looking at a place where you may not ever put another peaker plant. However, in, in the rest of the country, a lot of the other places, they don't have a lot of sun. They don't have the same kind of duct curve effects, and so you might not see this. But what you might see is that the cost of, again, over the next few years, storage is going to come down. Uh, and so that if you have four-hour peaks, five-hour peaks, you might actually make sense. And it actually might make sense before that if you take it into account the other benefits of, of energy storage. So you might see that sometime before 2025, uh, in a lot of the rest of the country, you will start seeing battery plants being placed uh, simply because uh, it is, a again, part of a portfolio, uh, and you might not need quite as much gas as you might otherwise do. So uh, it's a real, these are really interesting uh, uh, developments uh, that we've seen. Um, I want to also talk about distributed energy resources. So this is an area that I've been working on quite a bit uh, lately, uh, and uh, and looking at customer assets as part of that. So a lot of people will tell you, well, customer assets make a great uh, way of ma managing the grid. Uh, for example, if we have electric vehicles, and we have a ton of electric vehicles out there, millions of electric vehicles, then we can use them in conjunction uh, to manage uh, manage the grid. And you can, except that now you've got a grid asset that somebody might jump into and drive away. So you know you have to take in that into account. And how do you orchestrate that? How do you orchestrate millions of these systems? We're not just talking about dispatching individual systems. We're talking about orchestrating a huge number of them. And the thing we got to remember is that some things are better at this than others. So if you've got a solar system on your roof, the solar system on your roof is, is a great thing because all you care about is this delivering energy. You're not really using it for anything else. So I, as a utility, can come in and say, hey, I'll take that energy off your hands and you'll be really happy about that uh, if I give you a fair price. A battery is kind of like that. It's, it's, it's also just delivering energy, but you might want it for some backup energy. So it's a little bit less of a resource. Uh, and then when you get into some of these things like, uh, uh, you know, especially a backup resource for your home, if you get into an EV, you know, an EV, the primary use for EV is not to sell energy back to the utility. Primary use is for you to get around. So it's not as much of a grid resource as solar is. And then you get you know thermostats the same way, uh, and then you know you can go down the list all the way down to your TV. You don't buy your TV so that the utility can tell you to shut it off. <laughs> so you're not going to do that. So you, telling me that you're going to use your TV as a grid resource is really a waste of time. That's not a grid resource. Where you really want to look at are these things like thermostats, uh, washing machines even, hot water heaters, and the kind of appliances that, uh, uh, that, that Mark will tell you more about in just a moment. Uh, my last step is just uh, is to talk about how we're going to orchestrate these things. So when we look at this from a utility perspective, we want to be able to send the right signals to the endpoints so that those devices can actually know whether they're providing good services or not. And so uh, this is really about the distributed energy resource management system, DERMS. This is the cutting edge of research in this area. And what this means is that the utility can send signals out. It might be a price signal. It can send them out to aggregators if there are aggregators and the aggregators can talk to individual units so that they know what uh, uh, what the price is and they can decide what to do. Uh, it can go out to microgrids if there are any and do a local control over microgrids. And this is simply to, to make the whole system a lot easier because there's no way that a utility can dispatch millions of individual units. When you're talking about in your own home having a thermostat, a water heater, a uh, electric vehicle, a energy storage system, the solar on your roof, all communicating with the with the network at once. That can get very complicated. And so the whole idea is that we have these tools, we will have these tools that will be able to manage these things and actually be able to provide the same reliable, cost-effective, safe, and environmentally responsible power that you're used to getting. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. It's the first time I've been here, actually. And um, being from South California, not a Berkeley grad or, or uh, Stanford grad, but uh, from <laughs> Cal Poly Pomona, so <laughs> hey. during school. 
Um, what's interesting is the, I run a program called Emerging Markets and Technologies. And uh, emerging technologies have been around for a while. You know, we didn't, 10 years ago, we didn't have iPhones. We didn't have smart thermostats and things. And back in the 80s, with the Arab oil embargo, we were looking for new ways to control things because customers had air conditioners and they had pools. And believe it or not, they had water beds back there too. So it's like, how can we manage these appliances and these things that were, they're using energy? And then over time, things changed. We didn't really, we had too much energy. We actually wanted to sell more electricity. And then around 1999, 2000, something dramatically happened in California. It's called the California energy crisis. And all of a sudden, we could not buy enough electricity. As a matter of fact, at that time, PG&E went bankrupt. And we almost did. And we had to come up with a new way to give customers information. And this is where this whole concept of pricing came along. It, and that's where the term, that's where I learned in 2000, the term demand response. And we knew about efficiency and we knew about managing loads, but we didn't know that we had to now tell customers what the price of electricity was so that they could actually respond to it. So that generated in 2001, a whole bunch of programs. We went great guns going, developed a lot of new things. And in 2008, the economic crash happened. And what, what that did was empty a lot of buildings in California across the country, and our demand dropped. And we really didn't need to manage loads anymore because there really wasn't a whole lot of load. But what was coming up was solar. And in 2010, 2012, the solar started growing. And all of a sudden now, here we are, getting close to 2020, and now we have too much of a good thing. So just as we did in 1980s, just as we did in 2000, and here we are, demand response to the rescue, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what this challenge is. It's called overgeneration or oversupply. And it's basically what Haresh and, and uh, what we were talking about was that with solar, you can't manage it. You can't turn it off, or, or you, maybe you can, but you really can't dispatch it. You can't fire up a solar plant because the sun is shining. So we've gone from a couple of thousand megawatts to now 10,000 growing more and more. And this is when electric supply exceeds the demand. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. In California, we have a lot of air conditioners that ramp up in the summertime. Uh, we haven't reached our peak of over 40,000 megawatts, but we might get there again. Uh, and the solar is there to supply it. But in the shoulder months of March and in October, when there's not a lot of air conditioners running, but the sun is still shining, that solar happens every month of the year, we come into a situation we called overgeneration. And so here's your duck curve. Uh, what happens is during the middle of the day, the solar generates enough power to satisfy most of the load during the summertime. In the winter months or in the fall months, it actually can exceed that. Now, what you're seeing on the bottom of the curve is what's planned. This is what is in the queue for the CEC's power plant. So we had 10,000 megawatts of solar last year. There is 23 megawatts in the queue. And these are procurement. Okay, These are what's being planned to be built out in the Carrizo Plain and other places like that. This does not take into account your neighbor's house who's putting in a 4KW program or, or deck. Or they're, they're not putting in all these other things. And... The CEC this year has then mandated for next year to, uh, to mandate solar for all new construction. And that's not included in this graph. So, and we don't include all the other biogas and wind and geothermal as well. So what the market is doing, remember I'm emerging markets and technologies, and what I look at the markets is that because this is excess on the wholesale market, it's not considered economic. So it is curtailed. So what you're seeing there is a graph of the megawatt hours that the wholesale market has been curtailing over time. And at the far right is what is happening in the most recent months. Now, this is antithetical to California's policies. We didn't put all the solar in to turn it off. We must find a way of either utilizing it or adjusting things or changing our market structure. So we have the economic dispatch. We have the self-scheduled cuts. And so these are things that are happening beyond your electric bill. 
These are happening at the wholesale market. And sometimes there's so much solar, we export it to Arizona or to other states and so forth. So one of the things that I've been looking at, and, and thanks to Haresh and others, is that there are a lot of little grains of sand out there called pools and air conditioners and things like that. But to fill the belly of the duck, I need some big rocks. I can't be shoveling sand all day long. So we're looking at a program to engage the water sector, which one water plant can be two, three megawatts, which is several thousand customers, to look at how they can deal with the over generation. So when you look at a gigantic power plant, it's generating power during the middle of the day, and a water plant, which is pumping water, like in the Tehachapi's and so forth, they're using that energy, but they use it in accordance with their needs to treat water or to supply water. And then sometimes they can, they can use the energy during the middle of the day, but what's preventing them are the electricity rates. So the retail rates are not quite in alignment with that big duck curve. And that's one thing we're getting closer to. So we've been doing a study for the last year and last, last couple of years, and we've asked water agencies, you know, if electricity was free in the middle of the day, as opposed to charging you what it is, could you change your operations? And so I talked to the Coachella Valley Water District out in Palm Springs. They've got three dozen 300 horsepower pumps. Okay, that's a lot of load. That's a lot of air conditioners, a lot of pools. And they can manage that in accordance with rates. We look at other water districts that are treating Colorado River water and other things like that. So it's what we call operational flexibility. And it's a component of the shape, shift, shed, and shimmy of the family of demand response programs that we looked at. So it's kind of a dance move. I'm basically asking the water agencies, you know, if I came up with a different tune, could you dance? They'd say, you know what, we're good dancers, whether it's a waltz or a rumba, I know how to deal with it, okay? So what we're trying to do from our technology perspective is give them the chance to see how they can actually mo change their operations if we needed them to be the solar sponge to suck up some of that solar. Here's an example. On the top graph, you have a typical water agency, and this is what they do. Their rates tell them that during the middle of the day, your on-peak tariff is going to be expensive. So they stop pumping. They say, I've got a water tank. I'll fill it up. I'll keep it so full for, water, for fire protection, and then we're done. And then when the rate changes, I will go back to pumping again or treating with osmosis and things like that. At the bottom is a non-time of use rate period. And they basically operate their pumps and whatever when they need to, okay? So when you have 10 megawatts and your electric bill is in the millions of dollars, you become very rate sensitive, okay? Most residential and small commercial customers don't have that. Their Verizon bill is bigger than their electric bill most of the time, okay? But these folks are very smart. They have automated SCADA systems and so forth. So if I could roll some of these 10, 20, 50 megawatt boulders into the belly of the duck, I think I can really help things out and make a difference there. In addition to that, there's also the issue of water storage. And we've heard a lot about water in the last five or six years of the drought. And so in Southern California, we have a lot of storage that brings in Colorado River water. And the North, not so much. But the state water project moves a lot of water and they use a lot of energy. So perhaps they can be the answer that we can utilize for combining some of the generation. If I'm looking at 30,000 megawatts of solar down the road, I better start thinking big and looking at some of those contracts and see how we can do this. Now, what's interesting is one of the water guys explained to me that a, a water sort of basin is like a bathtub full of sand, okay? It has a, an impermeable basin around it and it's full of sand. You can just fill it full of water and then pull the water out whenever you need it. So there's a lot of those in California. And I know that we want to talk about the internet of things and smart thermostats and things like that, but when you're faced with, with a not to be ignored problem down the road, you sort of have to think big and try to look at these things. We're also looking at refrigerated warehouses, they have thousands and thousands of square foot of frozen foods and things like that. And they're, they only need to keep things at zero degrees Fahrenheit. 
they say, well, can you go down to minus 10? Yeah. Is it going to affect the chocolates from Belgium? No. Okay. So maybe we can use you as like a storage medium. Okay. That's a, that's a lot of pools and hot water heaters that we cannot have to fuss with. So refrigerated warehouses, any type of storage media, and of course there's more exotic technologies that we can look at. These are the things that we're examining not only with some of the grants that the Energy Commission is doing, but also with EPRI too, because they're good partners on that. And here's an example of the Willow Springs water bank. It's something that can, I think it's, I think the total megawatt is something like 200 megawatts is what they anticipate that they can store and shift. So dams are not a good thing because they destroy the environment. But under the ground, he was showing me a picture of their, and I was like, well, there's nothing here. Of course not. It's underground. There's nothing to see. So that's something which we want to encourage and want to look forward to. So in conclusion, I really think that when you look at a big challenge of too much of a good thing and you see the policy objectives down the road, you have to really think out of the box or out of the bathtub or something. And so one of the things we're looking at is getting involved with the sector. There's a lot of parallels between the electric grid and the water system. There's pressure. There's volume. They are smart people. They really want to work with California and doing the grid. So that's the partnership that I'm working on. And those are, that, this is one example of one of the many things that we're trying to adjust and fill the belly of the duck. Okay. Thank you. questions for our panelists. Uh, I'm going to ask the first question, but I'm sure there's questions from folks in the audience, and we'd like you to use the microphone. So anybody who wants to ask a question, if you could step up to the microphone. My question to you guys is, what do you think the biggest challenge is? We all heard great ideas and visions about technology, but Quick, quick comment. What do you think the biggest challenge is for us in the next five to ten years? All three of you, I'd like to answer. Okay, your first one. Uh, first, okay. <laughs> challenge. Quick, look at this line. We got to go fast. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> these are speed. Well, these are speed questions. Wow. Two major challenges that I'm really interested in seeing solutions to. Number one is the environmental impacts of offshore wind. We just started an offshore wind proceeding. We're looking at that. California has one of the largest resources of offshore wind. Modern offshore wind is 30, 30 plus miles offshore, so it's over the horizon. You can't see it. The visual impacts that you see uh, coming from the East Coast and other areas, no longer a serious issue, but there's still uh, concerns with the impacts on whales and things like that. So um, huge resource potential in California that really needs to be investigated and moved forward as quickly as possible. And secondly, all the sand that Mark mentioned um, I'm a big proponent. We have 13 plus million uh, hot water heaters for residential consumers in California. Each one of those can be uh, converted. Right now, they're gen generally natural gas. If you convert those over to a heat pump hot water heater uh, with a mixing valve so that it can be overheated and it has no risk of, uh, of scalding, uh, the hot water heater manufacturers have already committed to bring to market whatever we feel is appropriate. We just need to figure out how to aggregate those and present a useful resource to the grid. Everybody has hot water, and so it's a huge amount of thermal potential thermal storage. Uh, similarly, buildings themselves can be used as thermal storage, similar to yeah. the refrigeration that Mark mentioned. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, too. Uh, um, I think there are two major challenges from the technology side. And, uh, one is just simply keeping up with the need. Uh, you know, coming from the uh, you know policy end and regulatory side, and and the and and uh, the social uh, desire for change, uh, our grid is changing very very quickly. Uh, keeping up with that in terms of technical investment and and uh, making sure that we have the technology for it, making sure that that technology is deployed, uh, and that we can still maintain the level of reliability that that people have come to uh, expect, and the and the low cost. Um, is is quite a bit of a challenge. I think that along with that is separating the wheat from the chaff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that claims to be ready for prime time, or or you know is actually ready for deployment, uh, or that can make a difference. Uh, and you know a lot of it doesn't. Um, and testing it out, making sure that it works. Uh, you know, looking at some of these ideas, and and it's not always the most outlandish ideas that are actually the hardest to implement. Sometimes it's uh, you know a 
something that looks relatively straightforward, but uh, uh, is actually very difficult or and challenging for one thing or another. Looking at that dispassionately and and making sure that uh, you know we're, we're taking the most practical approach can always uh, be a challenge. Technology will always be there and it'll always find a way to solve a problem, but it's customer engagement. If we can figure out a way to get customers engaged to maintain and to develop and maintain that relationship, they are going to be our partners in the future for grid management. They're making their own electricity, they're storing it, they're driving it around in cars. So we need to engage them and, uh, and, and develop that. Great, thanks. Can you please say your name and uh, affiliation? Yes, uh, I'm Jonathan Livingston with Livingston Energy Innovations and want to thank the panelists and the uh, panel chair. Um, for uh, Haresh in particular, uh, but anyone else who would like to chime in, um, I'm going to start with EPRI. Uh, EPRI is an organization which represents electric utilities across the spectrum in the United States. We're gathered here in California, and as a number of speakers today have already pointed out, we're in a bit of a bubble in terms of how things are done here. I'm very interested in your saying a word or two about your experiences working in with utilities in the Midwest and the South, which have different energy profiles in terms of sources and storage in particular. And are you seeing economic benefits or other types of benefits that are driving storage outside of communities like the coastal communities with their very enlightened energy policies? Super fast answer, please, because we got a big line. Right. So let me, let me just clarify that we don't represent utilities. Uh, we, we do work with utilities. But um, so we do, uh, uh, we do see quite a bit of a difference. Uh, you know, things are, things are different everywhere. Um, that is not to say that they're not, you know, there are there are not possibilities. If you look at the Midwest, you know, low cost gas uh, and lots of wind uh, is very different from, uh, you know, what we have here in California with sun and and uh, a, a favorable uh, regulatory structure. Uh, in the South, it's it's quite a bit different because you have very large utilities actually that that are interested in developing new technologies. So uh, there's there's definitely a difference, and 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 the value propositions are different. Uh, that's not to say that um, that there's no value proposition. It's just that we have to look at different technologies. Thanks. Please. Okay. Uh, so Farhad Bilmori of the Australian Energy Market Operator, which is essentially the equivalent of CASO uh, here. Um, uh, great presentations. Thank you for for that for that insight. Uh, my question is um, in relation to uh, the the energy transition. One of the issues we've been seeing in Australia is sort of away from the duck curve and just energy balancing, is all these system services that used to be delivered by thermal generation, are now because you're seeing less and less of that generation, are now not being delivered or just you know you're having to force on generation when you ordinarily wouldn't. Um, that's forced us to think about, do we have the right market designs and economic frameworks? And I was just wondering whether you had views on that, really, to the whole panel. So what's what's the future of the, the economic framework and the market design for electricity? First, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's the market design and the economic framework that will drive those services. We've demonstrated those services using air conditioning loads, using pumping loads, using lighting loads. We, we've proven, I think, technically that it's possible to provide those ancillary services, uh, virtually the whole raft of ancillary services with those loads, uh, but we have to have the market design in place in order to incentivize customers to do that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah I mean, just, just and, and, you know, sometimes... Uh, you know, trying to understand whether it's a market or you know, trying to you know, other other mechanisms might also be something that's that uh, need to be considered. Yeah, California's just rolling out our time of use rates. Ten years ago, we suggested that they be put in place, and it's taken a little while to get here. But we're just rolling those out, and the utilities have already revised them over months, uh, over just month periods. You know, where they've revised them, and, and as Mark pointed out, they're still not quite matching up. And of course, the needs of the grid are going to change uh, daily, and you can't change the rates for consumers daily. So we have to move potentially to certain areas where we have transactive prices, where you have rapidly changing prices. You absolutely cannot involve a customer in that type of regime. It has to be automated, and it has to be invisible to the customer so it does not reduce their quality of service or their satisfaction. Thanks. So I have um, two uh, heat pumps for space heating at my uh, house. I have a third heat pump for hot water. I have a 10 kilowatt solar system, and I just bought an electric car. And I'm also contemplating buying a storage system because I'm in a wild urban interface, and the utility may be cutting me off in going forward in the future for possibly days at a time. What's missing in this picture is a sophisticated utility control system and tariff structure that best optimizes the use of these capital investments that I've made. 
So the utility is losing out. I'm losing out. Where, where do we stand on this? How long is it going to take before there's a sophisticated system for taking advantage of all these capital resources that I've invested in and I suspect other people have too? So, uh, you know, there are many such systems under development and under test. Uh, utilities are looking at that and, and uh, trying to implement them. And of course, I mean, there is some work that needs to be done on the market side as well to make sure that the, that the structures are in place and the rates are in place to do that. Uh, and I'd be very interested in getting your name uh, as a potential test site. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. In, in the 2019 building code, we just rolled out additional requirements for demand responsiveness, specifying an open source communication protocol for the first time, a specific communication protocol, open ADR. Uh, that'll go into effect in January 1st, 2020. They're, they're optional for residential, mandatory for some commercial uh, HVAC systems and whatnot. Uh, again, we're, we're in a significant transition period. As I said, you know, you know primarily when, when the vectors point in the same direction, it can get a little hectic. Uh, do not understand, underestimate how significant a transition period we're in. All options are on the table and we need to use them all. Okay, Sally Benson, Stanford University. Um, I really appreciated the remarks about partnering with the water system because they had very large controllable loads. So at Stanford, uh, we have a fully electrified uh, heating and cooling system and about 10 megawatts of a flexible load and, and with very large scale thermal storage as well. And last summer we participated in the demand response program and it worked really great for everyone. Uh, we were flexing five megawatts and all we succeeded. We also did some calculations specifically looking to operating in the middle of the day with the goal of reducing the carbon intensity of our power consumption. And that looked great. I mean, we could really operate in the sweet spot when there's excess solar. But our economic calculation showed that the demand charge was just going to kill us. And so that it was very, very expensive. So as you think about some of these really creative solutions, um, you know, how are people thinking about, you know, working with customers to deal with the demand charge when there are all these other system benefits that could be achieved? Yeah, and that's basically rate design. And that those are, um, there's probably half a dozen proceedings at the commission right now that have jurisdiction over our rate cases and our rate design. Um, it, it's about uh, cost of service. It's about uh, getting the right uh, signals to customers. And so, uh, as Gabe said, all that is in play right now. And as a matter of fact, we have some very innovative, smaller rates that we've come up with for solar customers and for customers with batteries. So um, that is, I think, probably the, the walking that's getting started. Uh, we have uh, only 20% of our energy with, is with residential. So the, the rest of the gang with the larger loads will be coming into play. And, uh, you know, it's a business. You have to be able to have revenue. <laughs> and sustain yourself, but it is also a um, uh, invest, an investor business that customers are part of that now. So the fact that you've learned how to dance, you've learned how to be flexible is, is, is strongly important. And that's what we're trying to encourage and the rates will soon follow, I'm pretty sure. And let me just say, uh, just to add that, you know, I think a very important part of all of this is, uh, you know, continued research to try to understand what those, you know, you know th th those things can do. Uh, you know, Demonstration projects, um, you know, getting data that can go back and, and help the uh, PUC make some of these decisions, I think, is uh, very important. Yeah. And, and it's, that's going to get worse because we are moving, as we move past 60% renewables and as we coincidentally decarbonize buildings, we're going to move to a winter peaking load in California. So we're going to have more and more excess generation. I, I prefer to call it idle generation <laughs> rather than over generation, but that's a nuance. Uh, we currently have a lot of natural gas facilities that operate for hours per year. We don't say that they're over generated. We say they're idle because they're not using any fuel. But um, as an aside, if you haven't seen the new energy facility here at Stanford, it's impressive. They give tours. Next. Please. Hi, Paul Breslow with EDF, Electricity de France, the world's second largest utility and big renewable developer and a big partner of EPRI's. Hi, Harish. Uh, I've led our research into transactive energy for a couple of years, and I view demand response as a great uh, big step in that direction. But what are your thoughts on transactive energy? Is it inev inevitable? How and if so, when will it come? And what can we do to make it happen? I have 100 homeowners in Westlake Village and Thousand Oaks in Southern California that are on a transactive energy pilot. Ed Caslitz here, he's the architect of that. They are getting wholesale price signals 
from the from the market. They go negative. And when those price signals go negative, it's like, here's a signal. The electricity is negative. Maybe you could run your pool a little faster or whatever. So it's here today. It's, you know, I mean, two years ago, I was told, well, that's okay. Let's figure this out. Now we can't get enough people that are interested in it. And this is not blockchain. It's not some type of cryptocurrency. It's basically <laughs> just a peer-to-peer -peer network. And it keeps the utility whole through a subscription model. So it's something that is both practical and elegant. And I think that it's an imminent future uh, model design. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I think, I think that, the, that the, um, the technology is all there. It's not really you know, something that's waiting for a breakthrough in blockchain or something like that. I think it's, it's more about having enough data to understand whether it makes sense, you know, where, you know what are the benefits, uh, and having a regulatory process that allows it. Mm -hmm. And transactive energy is more is basically just a large optimization problem. So we can pull in more than just the economic factors. You can look at the, the values that the individual designs. Uh, so uh, solutions for transactive energy uh, could be, I think, generalized to uh, manage microgrids. Uh, um, I've had a lot of opportunity to work with the healthcare industry in California over the last couple of years, and they're being brought under the energy code. And uh, one of the most interesting things for them is to consider microgrids for large hospitals, particularly in areas of the grid where they may be curtailed for long periods of time. Yeah. And when you put a large healthcare institution on a, on a microgrid, you have to learn how to balance that microgrid in a way to optimize how long it can stay islanded. Uh, and that comes down to balancing each individual load within the hospital and ensuring that the ventilator stays on versus the vending machine. Yeah. And we're very proud of the fact that we got Amazon, Am Alexa's vocabulary to better understand what demand response was in the product. Okay, we're, we're at our hour, but I think we can go a few minutes over okay. because I think we started a few minutes late, so we got three more. Let's yeah. keep going. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah. Allow me to ask this question. And, uh, Hi, Harish, everybody. And uh, well, the question is how we can help the customer to realize the value of behind the middle DER, uh, like this gentleman. And uh, uh, then uh, California has been doing a great job, but we can, we can, we can be better. For instance, like uh, Sunrun has awarded in the early of this year, awarded the first capacity market, a uh, wholesale capacity market for the aggregate uh, home level solar plus storage at ISO New England not California, right? right? How we can open more market products to engage customers, to engage behind the middle DERs. That's the first part of the question. Second part is, then in the future, we see a lot of behind the middle DERs, they participate in the wholesale, or they can participate in the distribution level. But the electron is flow in one system. For instance, if they participate in the ISO, they will go through distribution system, right? And what's the impact on distribution system? If they participate in the distribution service, then how they may mislead the ISO load forecasting. How do we address this kind of future? Well, so as I said before, customers need to be part of the relationship. And we're doing a number of tests as are going across the country. EPRI is involved with a lot of those. We're doing a lot of them in California as well. So for a customer, they did not purchase a television or an air conditioner like we talked about earlier to bid into the market. This is the utility of that appliance and that end use is food preservation, comfort, uh, you know, entertainment. Those are the things they're asking for. But they, but there is that opportunity. So how do we develop new models of demand response, new models of engagement? And that's through appropriate, secure communications and proper pricing models and proper tariffs. So. There's a possibility the price of electricity might even change to where you live, okay, as it's changing now towards the time of day. Those are all in play, and as those end uses grow, and as more of them become in different areas, uh, that becomes more significant to grid operations. So I think it is, again, emerging, but that's all in, in line and all in sight. Very insightful question. That's a, it's a great question, and I think it's uh, going to become increasingly important. Certainly, the utilities are all working overtime to try to you know, address uh, exactly the issue that, that you mentioned about coordinating between distribution, transmission, the markets, and, and everything else. Um, and and you know, we'll, we'll see how quickly we can move to, to meet the need. Um, certainly, I think, I think an important part of, of, of all of this is going to be just a general understanding that this is, this is something that needs, needs investment.
uh, and that you know it needs engagement from from uh, from all of the different stakeholders in this group. Uh, some some of what we see, unfortunately, is a a maybe not a full recognition of just how difficult this challenge is uh, in terms of being able to keep the lights on along with meeting our other goals of uh, you know higher renewals penetration and and so on and, and sometimes I think. Uh, People have planted a flag in, in the ground in terms of goals without considering all of those. And I want everybody working on this to print out and stick on the wall, customer satisfaction, quality of service. That should be number one anytime that we're dealing with customer engagement. We don't want anybody that's engaged in demand management or demand optimization to at any point in time have a reduction in their quality of service unless they have engaged in that fully voluntarily and they're getting suitably compensated for that. In general, it should be automated and invisible. Okay. okay, we got two more. Let's Thank go you. fast. These are speed answers, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola yes, no. Molter from VMware. So I'm glad you mentioned the microgrid because we're in the process of building a microgrid on campus. And one of the things we wanted to demonstrate, just as kind of an experiment, is a transactive grid using uh, some of the internal grid uh, demand uh, devices. Uh, can you comment on data centers as a potential grid resource? Because obviously a huge consumer, but more complicated than pumping water. Well, real quick, uh, uh, so I've seen some studies that show that data centers actually have a much higher tolerance for changes in temperature than than traditionally assumed. I'm not just talking about cooling. I'm talking about uh, the, changing the, the compute yeah, virtualization, load. Oh, the virtualization, yeah, virtualization, yeah. yeah. shifting, yeah. So, demand shifting. Yeah. Just a quick answer. PG&E has a program. Yeah. Southern California Edison has a program. We have a data center uh, center of excellence. We've done studies on that. So um, you know, it's like talk to your rep. Yeah, Say, I want to be part of, want to be a that. program. Yeah. We need yeah. some public case studies. Yeah, I think there's some holistic uh, analysis that has to do, that, you know, can be done to look at all of those considerations, you know, virtualization along with, you know, looking at, at some of the other things. And I think one of our experts is right, right up here in the front row. Right. So uh, we can, we can yeah, talk after this. That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> in addition to virtualization, there's thermal capacity and then there's right. the, the pure electrical capacity because they all have massive backup systems. Yes. Great. Thanks. Thanks. One more. Last one. Last but not least. Hi. Mark Roost. Um, if you use batteries to dodge demand changes, how will it change your management planning when you can get batteries for under $100 a kilowatt hour in two to three years? When consumers and CNI start putting up enough solar on roofs and canopies to serve over 95% of building and associated vehicle need load needs via batteries with battery storage making that possible? Because it's a combination of lightweight Canopies, lightweight solar, mm -hmm. low expensive solar, and low expensive storage, stationary storage batteries, plus all electrified fleet. Sure. I mean, from from our perspective, that's already happening. You know, we're, we're already seeing a great deal of deployment yeah. of those systems, uh, and you know, it's already starting to make an impact on on um, on the way that loads are, are managed. I think that uh, in the long run, we have to look at that from a rates perspective, and you know, understand um, th those those changes have to be accounted for. Uh, you know, in, in, in future, uh, um, in any approach to the grid in the future. Well, if you really go for microgrids as the basic structure, those, instead of investing more distribution and transmission, invest more in microgrids and local distributed generation and storage, mm -hmm. and the total cost will probably be a lot lower. Well, so, the, so there is a regulatory challenge here. Any of these innovations that we implement at the grid edge needs to trickle back into the utility planning process so that they're not installing uh, hardware that is redundant with these uh, these solutions that are at the grid edge. So, hey, the, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, Mark, you get the last comment, and then we're going to wrap it up. Sure, sure. So customers install solar to reduce their energy costs. They install batteries to reduce their demand costs. So these are somewhat cost mitigation issues. But you're right. Here's a great opportunity for the utility to reach a hand across the transformer and say, we want to be a partner with you in managing your operations and you can help us. And I think that's when you now have systems that generate real power instead of acting like loads, then that's really the benefit. So like we all said, these are all in play and they're all, in, they're all imminent and we are looking forward to figuring out the answers to these challenges. Okay, I want to thank everybody. That was a great question to end the session on. Thank you for your attention and thanks to our panel.